In this lecture, we're going to start a discussion of a very powerful elastoplastic model, which is called the Camp Clay model, and it is valid for uncemented sediments. This model is a branch of critical stage soil mechanics and was originally developed for soils, constitutive behavior of soils. The model is uh, very powerful and captures many of the features that we have mentioned before, like strain hardening, strain softening, and of course also perfect plasticity. And it allows us to calculate plastic strains for those two conditions. We're going to show the development of the model for an uncemented sediment, but the model also with a few changes can be adapted to a cemented rock. The video is going to be, or the lecture is going to be, divided in two parts. In the first part, we're going to discuss the basics of the Camp Clay model. By the way, this is, comes from Cambridge, Cambridge Clay. And uh, on the second part, we'll discuss about how to calculate those elastoplastic strains and how to put together the stiffness matrix for plastic strains. All right, so here uh, you have uh, pretty much the solution of uh, two stress paths, and uh, I'm going to uh, recreate those two stress paths in detail now. First of all, uh, to get started, let's talk about uh, the stress paths, which is something that I'm going to need in this discussion. So for this discussion, we're going to assume that we have a axisymmetric triaxial test in which I'm going to load these samples until yield. In this axisymmetric triaxial test, I'm going to conduct it under drain conditions. So that means that there are not going to be excess pore pressure caused by volumetric deformation. Because it is axisymmetric, also, we are going to add a given confining pressure. Sigma 2 and sigma 3 are going to be the same because of the axisymmetric conditions. And then, for a typical test, I'm going to keep this constant for a given test. And as I keep the confining pressure or stress constant, then what I do is I increase the value of sigma 1 until yield. This is the type of experiment that we do in order to, um, in order to build these stress paths that I'm going to show in a minute. All right, uh, before we do that, uh, let's uh, see what would be the stress path in the PQ space? Under these conditions, we have that uh, P is going to be the mean effective stress and Q is going to be the deviatoric stress. And for the conditions I mentioned before, notice that if I increase the deviatoric stress, and I am also going to increase the variable P because I'm increasing sigma 1. Sigma 1 is the, the only one changing. So if I make a change of sigma 1, the variation of sigma P is just going to be the variation of sigma 1 divided by 3. And if I change sigma 1 during deviatoric loading, keeping sigma 3 equal to a constant value, then the variation of the deviatoric stress is going to be just the variation of the deviatoric loading. And this is what we call deviatoric loading, for which this stress path is going to result in a variation of 
delta q over delta p prime equal to 1 over 3. This one divided this one on top. Let me bring, bring this 3 closer to, to here because it looks like it is related to the equation below. And let me also bring this one over here. Okay, that is what explains this stress path over here. And now that we know that slope for the stress path, uh, let's see what are these uh, responses in this diagram. All right, as we have evolved here on the y-axis, we're going to have the deviatoric stress on the x-axis, I'm going to have P prime. I'm going to add another axis over here, which is going to be the strain in direction number one, in the direction of the loading. And I am going to add one more axis, which is going to be the volumetric strain. The first thing to notice in this type of model is that we have a fixed line which is called the critical state line. This critical state line, let me draw it, is going to be the line at which the material always is going to tend to. You could also call it a terminal state line because it, it has a meaning that uh, any condition in any state is always going to tend into this line. And this is a line that we're going to see that is not going to move. There are some other uh, lines and surfaces that are going to move and are going to change, but this one is not going to change. And this line is going to have a slope which is going to be M. Uh, notice that here we have a mean stress and here we have a deviatoric stress. So you may also think this similar to as the case when we deal with more circles in which here we have the shear stress and here we have the normal stresses. But now state of stress is a point, it's not a circle. But it is, it's a similar meaning and M also is related to the friction angle. All right, so this is our critical state line and this is part of our constitutive model. The second thing that we're going to have here is the yield surface. And that yield surface is related to that critical state line. And notice that the apex of this ellipse coincides with the critical state line. So let's draw the critical, uh, the yield surface. And at the center of the ellipse, uh, that's where the apex of the ellipse is going to be. I'm just trying here the drawing of the lips and that's uh, that's not bad so if that's the center of the lips then I should have the other end more or less over here and it's going to look more or less like this well I didn't like that much, this one that much so let me try again um, mm, not that much either let me try one more time and All right, one more time. This is getting pretty tough to draw this ellipse. And I'm not going to give up. Let me put myself in another position. Hmm. All right, just be patient. I know I can do it. Oh, this is terrible. Wait, one more time. Okay, now I have to really change position. And I like that one a lot better. All right. Okay. So now we have our yield surface. And remember that yield surface is related to 
the critical state line. That yield surface has characteristic points. Uh, for example, the point at which I will start having plastic strains with a pure compression state where Q is equal to zero is going to be in this axis and that's something which is called the pre-consolidation pressure and takes the parameter P0. This point over here, therefore, is going to be at P0 over 2. All right, and um, I think now we have our yield surface. We have these two parameters that characterize the yield surface and the critical state line. Usually this one goes by CSL. And uh, let's recreate two stress paths for triaxial loading of the sediment. And what is very important to keep in mind here is that this sediment is the same and just starts with the is going to start with different conditions. So let's start first with a triaxial test at a relatively high mean stress, which is this one. Let's say that I start at a point somewhere over here. Uh, usually when we run a tri triaxial test, the first thing that we do is we increase simultaneously sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, without any deviatoric stress to the desired confining pressure or to the desired mean stress, and then we load it. So first there is a path that goes from the center towards the confining pressure or mean stress that I want, and then the deviatoric loading follows. So here I'm just drawing the part of the deviatoric loading. And as we have seen in these equations, the deviatoric loading is going to take place in a path such that the increase of uh, delta Q over P is going to be one third, or what it means uh, for every delta Q that I increase, the increase of uh, delta P is uh, going to be um, is going to be. Let me let me change this because I actually realized that there was a minor mistake here. Delta Q divided delta P is going to be 3. So for every increment of delta P prime equal to 1, delta Q is going to be 3. And therefore, the slope here is going to be 3 to 1. So my stress path is going to look like this. Where this slope for every increment of P prime 1 this is going to be equal to 3. Okay, once we are inside the, the yield surface, all what I'm going to have are elastic strains. And uh, let me plot that in these two other plots. And in order to do that, I'm going to need the help of here a horizontal extension of this point. And as I increase the deviatoric loading on the rock, there is going to be strain in, uh, in direction 1 or in direction Q. Uh, let me give it as 1 as I have it over there. And it's going to look something like this. Remember, this is just the elastic part. All right? And if I want to go further and also plot the volumetric strain increasing this deviatoric strain or strain in direction one I also will uh, or the sediment will also experience a compression so let me draw this line meaning that this is a compression going from this point to the other all right, so far we are in the elastic domain. When we get to the yield surface is when the plastic strains are going to start to take place. And the path is going to continue in the same direction. The stress path is not going to change because I have plastic strains. 
what are going to change are the strains, but the stress path will continue the same. And this path is going to continue until it hits the critical state line. And remember that I told you that critical state line is sort of a terminal state. So once you get there, uh, you cannot go beyond that point. And we'll see that uh, what is the reason for that in, in a minute. Okay, so what happens then during this plastic regime to the strains? This is what happens. The sediment is going to deform and that deformation is going to happen progressively and it's going to look more or less like this. It's going to be an asymptotic behavior towards the critical state line and once it gets to the critical state line will have increases in strain or deformation direction 1 or epsilon q uh, but there are not going to be any more changes of stress this is going to be the maximum deviatoric stress that the material can take it cannot take any other higher stress and for the volumetric strain part notice that in this uh, yield surface we said that the plastic strains depend on the vector normal to the surface and the plastic strain is going to be composed by a vectorial summation of the plastic strain in the direction of the volumetric part and the plastic strain in the direction of the deviatoric component so when we get to this point the the only thing that is going to to survive is going to be the deviatoric strain again this is going to be a lot clearer once i finish with the other path but remember and that's why i was drawing this that because we are in this section and i have a component of the plastic strain towards this direction in coincidence with the direction of compression I am always going to have a compression in this side of the yield surface therefore my volumetric strain is going to look something like this it will continue compressing and it will continue compressing with an asymptotic trend that once it reaches the asymptotic trend the volumetric strain is not going to change anymore and we'll get to this point to the isochoric deformation in which there is no change in volume let me extend this red line so it matches what I have here on top on the bottom another one All right, so this is what we would see if we load a sediment triaxially on this side of the yield surface. Uh, and remember, it will get always stronger and it will tend into a limited or a maximum strength, which is this value over here and depends on the critical state line. Notice that if I were to start somewhere over here, I will get to a higher strength. And that makes sense because I'm starting at a higher mean stress. All right. Let's go now to the other case. What happens when I go through failure through this other side of the yield surface? And I believe I have that in green over here. Uh, yes in green so let's do that I'm going to start somewhere over here and in order to make it uh, to use the same line and let me go 
somewhere over here. First, I increase sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, I get over here, sigma 1 is equal to sigma 3 and sigma 2, so q is equal to 0. Now, I'm going to start the deviatoric loading. The stress path doesn't care about what the material is, is made of, it's something that you impose. So, as I do that, then this is going to be the stress path. Okay, notice something here. Now we are going through the critical state line towards the yield surface. And on this side of the yield surface, I'm going to have a dilation as I go through the yield surface and, uh, and not a, a contraction. So what I'm going to, to have is a dilation that is going to happen as we reach the yield surface or also it might happen a little bit earlier. So let me simplify this and make it to happen at the point at which we have the critical state line in order to also make it easier to understand. And let me draw the elastic part of this. For the elastic part, I was dropping my pen trying to look for another pen for another color, but now remember that I have this tablet with just one pen. And uh, all right, so then what we will see is that up to this point, it, the material is elastic. And let's assume that uh, the coefficient of uh, elasticity is the same. So this path will be the same as the previous one. As I compress it in one direction, also the material is going to compress. And I'm going to need one more grid line over here. So similar to before, the material is going to compress. But now I'm going to get into the dilation. And what is going to happen in this case is that as I continue loading past the critical state line and reaching the yield surface is when I'm going to start to develop plastic strengths. But not only that, also, as we said before, the material is going to tend after or during the failure process to the critical state line. And in case since I'm past the critical state line, material is going to come back through the same path and is going to go into the critical state point. And what it, that means in the, the Q and epsilon 1 space and also for the volumetric strain is that the stress is going to increase. Here I'm going to start seeing a dilation. The stress is going to increase. It's going to reach a peak, which is going to be the peak that is given by the yield surface. And then the material will tend asymptotically to the critical state condition. But notice that now we have gone through that peak and the material soften as we apply more and more strain. And for the, from the volumetric point of view, uh, what this is going to look is la, something like this. As I get to this point, then uh, I start to see a dilation. And uh, let me make this coincide with the previous, with the previous one. I'm going to need also another uh, grid line. Here, I'm going to have, oh, that was too short. I'm going to have a trend to go into change of volumetric strain. Remember that going in the direction of the volumetric strain is going to be a compaction going against the direction of the volumetric strain is going to be a dilation. 
And these two paths that we see here are what are called strain softening because the material gets uh, softer or I would say, I think the better word is weaker as you increase the strain in that direction or as you continue applying a deviatoric strain and this material is called or is said to have a strain hardening response because it's getting stronger as you continue applying a strain on it and what you will you may expect as well is that if we have a stress path that goes exactly through the apex of this ellipse then I will run into perfect plasticity so if I were to have a stress path that goes directly over here then I will just have elastic strains up to here and as soon as I get into the yield surface the material will just tend into perfect elasticity and just one value of the maximum deviatoric stress and everything in between is going to be to go from strain softening to strain hardening notice that the closer that you are to the origin or the lower the mean stress the higher the strain softening is going to be and the higher you are in mean stress then the bigger is going to be the maximum deviatoric stress that you can apply on this material probably you have seen some of this before and it is uh, usually known as the transition from brittle to ductile in which for example if I were to draw this part of the plot with epsilon 1 and Q or sigma 1 minus sigma 3 then many materials show that for a low confining pressure they develop a brittle failure but as you keep on increasing the confining pressure or confining stress the material starts to show that was too much of a young modulus increase the material starts to show a behavior that goes into a more ductile behavior and eventually the material is going to get strain hardening let me try one more time I'm not very precise today with my drawing and this is the response that you will have increasing sigma 3 and is what is called a transition from brittle to ductile but the important thing to notice over here is that all of these materials are the same material it's just the initial condition that changes particularly the effective confining stress at which you initiate the test all right so we have seen now what uh, this equation is uh well we have seen the yield surface what it looks like what i like to talk a little bit more about now is uh, what are the parameters that we need in order to fully describe this yield surface and how to operate mathematically uh, with the surface and the first thing that we're going to do is to talk about the critical state line notice that this critical state line is a line for which the that tells me what is the terminal or critical q as a function of p and in an equation uh, this is equal to q is equal to m times p prime at 
the critical state line. All right, um, so let's try to obtain what the value of m is. m, as defined by this equation, is equal to q over p prime. And I know that q is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 for an axis symmetric tri triaxial test. And I know that p prime is sigma 1 plus 2 sigma 3 divided by 3 because sigma 2 is equal to sigma 3. Okay, then let's uh, do the following. Let's calculate what m would be for a friction angle, or actually the critical state friction angle, equal to 30 degrees. Remember, this is similar to a friction angle, but specifically in this context means the angle for the critical state line. And if, if I were to have this uh, friction angle equal to 30, I know, if you remember uh, from our discussion before about, about Mor Coulomb, that the maximum sigma 1 I could have would be equal to 1 plus sine of the friction angle divided 1 minus sine of the friction angle, and that's for 30 degrees is equal to, th to the number 3. So sigma 1 will be equal to 3 sigma 3. So now let's replace sigma 1 for 3 sigma 3, and the solution is going to be that here I'm going to have 2 sigma 3s, 3 minus 1, and here I'm going to have uh, 3 plus 2, 5 sigma 3s, and all of that divided by 3. And sigma 3 and sigma 3 are the same, are going to cancel out. And this is going to be 6 divided by 5, or otherwise 1.2, or I should say, or the same, is 1.2. So, for a friction angle equal to 30 degrees, or for a critical state angle equal to 30 degrees, let me be more precise, then M is equal to 1.2. And this is more or less the range of the value of M for sediments, around 1. In general, for a friction angle, uh, which is uh, for a critical state angle, which is not 30 degrees, the general equation for M is going to be, this is three times the maximum stress anisotropy given by the critical state angle. And this is uh, what I'm writing right now minus 1, and this is 2 plus the maximum principal stress and isotropy in terms of the critical state angle. But as we saw before, it's a value which is around uh, 1.2. All right. We have now the equation for the critical state line, and we know typical values for the equation of the critical state line. Let's talk now about the yield surface. The yield surface is going to have also an equation, and that equation uh, looks as follows. We're going to write the yield surface now instead of uh, in terms of principal stresses as we did before, in terms of Q, in terms of P prime, and in terms of one more variable, which is going to be the pre-consolidation pressure. And why? Because the yield surface it is something that is going to change with the pre-consolidation pressure. I want to explain that in a minute, and you will see that it makes sense. The equation is the equation of ellipse, and this ellipse 
it looks like this mathematically where this is m m square p prime pre consolidation pressure minus p prime equal to zero okay um, so let's uh, do uh, let's say a few things about uh, this uh, yield surface uh, first of all let's try to understand that this is an ellipse okay and there are is several points along this ellipse that I can use in order to verify that, that this equation makes uh, makes sense okay uh, for example if uh, in this equation uh, Q is equal to zero then in order to hold the equality I know this one is not going to be this zero and for the non-trivial case uh, for this one equal to be equal to zero well actually I could do that let me expand that there are two solutions for this one to be equal to zero the first one is that p prime is equal to zero and that's the this point right here at the origin p prime equal to zero but we are not that much interested in that one the other solution is that p prime is equal to the pre-consolidation pressure p naught which is this point over here now notice that this pre-consolidation pressure is going to be a variable okay so so let me just um, tell you a few more things and then we'll come back to that in this ellipse also I could have q equal to the value predicted by the critical state line and in that case if I do that and replacing mp prime in this equation and uh, then I can have this as a common factor and the result is going to be that uh, when q is equal to mp prime or when q is on the critical state line then the value of p prime has to be the pre-consolidation pressure divided by two and such a point is that value so when q is on the critical state line then the value of uh, p prime the effective mean stress is uh, the pre-consolidation pressure divided by two okay so we are familiar already with q and p prime Th those are sort of invariants of the stress tensor what the the new the new key in the in the block here is the pre-consolidation pressure so let me write that so we can talk a little bit more about that this is the pre-consolidation pressure or if I could change the name I would change it to stress but uh, in, in this model is known as a pre-consolidation pressure let me emphasize one more time that this is a variable and it's a variable which is part of the yield surface it tells us also what is the size of the yield surface because the higher the value of the pre-consolidation pressure as we can see over here the bigger the ellipse is going to be and third let me gain some space here and third this is also going to be our hardening parameter And what that means is that the yield surface is going to either increase in size or decrease in size based on this parameter. And uh, this hardening uh, parameter is going to be a function 
of the change in the plastic strain for the volumetric part which is similar to saying that this is going to be a function of the change of porosity in these soft sediments any plastic or any change any volumetric change in the sediment is going to be uh, or is going to go directly into changes in porosity all right so let me exp explain that with an example uh, to see how that works and uh, I'm going I'm doing this in, in a different plot now than what we had before because uh, it's usually easier, easier to explain it that way I need more space over here so I'm going to draw something similar to what I had before with Q over here P prime over here epsilon 1 and volumetric strain I'm going to draw my critical state line and I'm going to draw my yield surface so difficult to draw these ellipses all right not not that bad and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw a stress path of strain hardening. So I'll start somewhere over here. It's exactly the same what I was doing before, but now I want to make emphasis on the hardening parameter. I'm going to load it up to the yield surface. When I get to the yield surface, I start to see plastic strains. Okay. Well, what we're going to do differently now is we're going to do small changes and see what happens with it, each small change in the plastic strain. All right, as soon as I walk out of the yield surface, I'm going to have a plastic strain on the volumetric component and uh, what according to what i said before that's going to affect the pre-consolidation pressure which is our hardening parameter and this is going to be so up to here this is going to be elastic and the mirror do also the polymetric part Okay, this was not a good choice. Let me start again at a different part in the in the in the loading. Uh, actually, I want to have more more space to do this. Okay, so let me start. Yeah, somewhere over here, I think it's gonna be better. Okay, um, I start my stress pad over here, I get to the yield surface, I do a small increment over here that results in elastic deformation first and plastic deformation later on that is starting to go and to develop plasticity. Alright, after I develop this initial plasticity and this initial increment of the plastic strain on the compression side what is going to change now is the size of the yield surface because since I went beyond the yield surface now my new yield surface is going to pass or is going to be updated to this new point therefore the yield surface the new one is going to be something like this new ellipse where now it's going to go through here and I'm going to have an increment of the pre-consolidation pressure and if I continue 
with further increments each time is going to be the same each time I continue and I go beyond the previous pre-consolidation stress the yield surface is going to increase and what happens the reason why this turns into an asymptotic trend as we get to the critical state line is that when I get to the critical state line I'm I have moved my yield surface to this condition where now the top of the ellipse lies on the critical state line itself so let me try if I can continue the or draw the ellipses for these other uh, points but I hope the message is clear here what I'm doing is each time I go uh, beyond the yield surface I'm causing a positive change of the plastic strain and that's causing the movement of the pre-consolidation pressure to the right and I need one more all right and the asymptotic value that this is going to tend to is going to be something like this where when I am at this condition my yield surface has changed it's now over here and with the volumetric strain something similar is going to happen and it's going to tend into this change uh, this trend asymptotic trend where there is not going to be any change of volumetric strain anymore and notice that this volumetric strain and this change are linked to the to the th these two variables are linked with each other so whenever I have an increment in the volumetric strain into compression and I have a plastic deformation I have an increment of the yield surface in size up to the point in which I get to the critical state line and at the point of the critical state line the only component that I'm going to have if I were to continue loading is a plastic strain which just happens in the direction of the shear strain okay so um, I, I hope I hope this uh, logic uh, was clear that uh, whenever I move into this direction then my yield surface is going to increase in size let me put some numbers just to make it clear this was the initial and this is uh, after uh, time uh, passes by let's put some index alright so there's just one more thing that I like to, to discuss now and it is uh, what uh, this pre-consolidation pressure uh, physically means and how we can characterize it and, and how we can uh, handle this variable in order to put it into the model okay so let me scroll down a little bit more and we'll get back into the equations the pre-consolidation pressure as we said is going to be a function of the plastic strain in the volumetric component also we can write this equation let's call it f star as a function of porosity because volumetric strains are going to be linked to porosity and in this case we are going 
to assume that most of the deformation, volumetric deformation, goes into changes in porosity. Okay, and we're going to do one more thing. Instead of talking directly about porosity, this model likes to handle the variable of porosity through something which is called void ratio. But it is similar to porosity. So what is the void ratio? Imagine that you have a granular material. And let me just draw the spheres or the grains. But uh, hopefully you get the idea. Well, this is going to take two more secs to apply a color. Ideally, uh, we can uh, think as that as the pore space or the volume of the pores and the solid space or the volume of the solids. So uh, here, this is going to be the total volume. And we know that for such solid, by definition, porosity is equal to the volume of the pores divided the total volume. And this new variable void ratio is equal to the, or is defined as the volume of the pores divided the volume of the solids. So it's a, it's a similar uh, definition, but uh, it, it captures the pore space, but a little bit differently through the volume of the solids. And from here, uh, I could say that, for example, the total volume is equal to one. And if I do that, by the definition of the void ratio, the volume of the pores then is going to be uh, BP and the volume of the solid is going to be the vo total volume minus the volume of the pores, right? And I could go ahead and divide uh, this equation by, by VT, the total volume, which is going to be, since I have assumed that here is equal to 1, this is going to be that, or it's going to tell me that the boy ratio is the porosity divided 1 minus porosity. So this is, this is how you convert from porosity to boy ratio. All right, we're very close to getting to, to the end here. Let's hang on, uh, five more minutes. What we want to do now is to see how P naught or the pre-consolidation pressure changes as a function of the void ratio. And that's what we do on an experiment that follows an isotropic compression. So for example, I could run an experiment in which I increase P prime and just P prime, forget about the deviatoric loading. I grab a sediment and I increase the stresses in all directions so that I see what is the change of porosity or void ratio. And what you are going to, to get and, and you should expect is that as you increase the loading in all directions, sigma 1, sigma 3, sigma 2, they are all the same, right? The porosity or the void ratio is going to decrease. So this is going to look something like this. And usually we can measure that uh, experimentally. This is what is called an isotropic compression line. And again, it's measured by doing an isotropic compression test. This is not the same as the one we did before. The, the one before was a deviatoric compression test. This is, this is an isotropic 
compression test. And it's also drained, okay? So there is no excess of pore pressure. And what uh, we see from, from this plot is that uh, as we increase the, the compression on our sediment, the porosity and the boil ratio are going to decrease. And for decreases of the porosity and the boil ratio, what we're going to have are increments of P0. So from here, a decrease in porosity, which is the same as a decrease in the void ratio is going to cause an increase in the pre-consolidation pressure. That's why when a material gets more uh, compacted, it appears to be, or it actually gets stronger. Why? Because the grains get closer to each other. The coordination number, which is the number of grains touching each grain with each other increases and frictional forces increases and all your material uh, gets stronger. And this is how we're going to relate uh, these two variables. And, and we'll see that there is an equation for that, uh, that we're not going to discuss about that uh, right now in detail, but we'll do in the, in the, next, in the next lecture. But the last thing that I'd like to, to highlight is that the yield surface that we have been drawing so far can be also drawn in three dimensions as a function of the void ratio where if this is q and this is p prime the relation between p prime and the void ratio is what i see over here and is the isotropic consolidation line which looks something like this on the plane p prime void ratio and this is the isotropic consolidation line if you remember in the qp space we have the critical state line and the last thing to draw is going to be the yield surface the yield surface depends, the size of the yield surface depends on where I am along this axis. Let me highlight that this is a function of porosity. So the lower the porosity, the higher the isotropic, the higher the yield surface is going to be, the higher the porosity, the smaller that's going to be. And that's captured by another line over here, which is this um, a line which uh, it, this one is always difficult to draw so hopefully I get it in one shot it looks something like this where this is the projection of the yield surface on the critical state line and where the yield surface goes from a point along the isotropic consolidation line to a point in this three D surface line, and it looks something like this, where now this is the yield surface, but remember that that yield surface depends on porosity or boy ratio. And actually, this is just one yield surface, and there is a family of yield surface, and this is actually a continuous surface in three dimensions, that looks something like this. Where the yield surface that I have, for example, let me come back now over here, drawn over here, is just one of those yield surfaces for a given porosity. When I have a plastic strain, the porosity changes, the yield surface changes, changes and I start to see how that changes and these yield surfaces that I see are the yield surfaces that are on a continuous surface on this three-dimensional plot uh, that defines the 
the full yield surface now as a function of porosity. Okay, so we're going to pick up now with uh, on this topic and show the equations that characterize the isotropic consolidation line, which is the, the only one missing, and also we'll add the components of the elastic deformation, and with those we'll be able to compute plastic strains for the cam clay model.